Well, good morning. I haven't seen you in a while. Good morning. <laughs> the Lord is good to us. I'll tell you where I grew up, they're having a blizzard today. So it makes me thankful right now that I'm here. But um, yeah, I just wanted to make one little comment. Um, you know, I've talked about going with the choir to sing, and I, I don't know that the, the uh, purpose of that has been made quite clear to everyone. There is a, it's a hot dog lunch as a fundraiser, and there is a member there who is in stage four cancer, and there are some expenses they're trying to, trying to help their, the member with, and so they're going to have some, some singing and some eating, and so, you know, just leave it open to others if you want to go and participate in any way, you're, you're certainly welcome to do that, but at least you understand what the purpose of it, of it all is, and I believe, you know, it's something we can do that we can honor the Lord with, and, and minister some life and faith, and Praise God. We might be the one in that position someday. So, uh, but anyway, uh, this was one of those occasions where I went to bed last night, didn't have a clue what the service was going to be about today, and then different times during the night I kind of had little, a little inkling here, a little inkling there, and it seems like the Lord is confirmed by a lot of things that have been sung and said today. And I believe we need some encouragement in our battles and the scripture that I had thought of as a kind of a jumping off point is one that's very familiar to us in Revelation chapter 12. But you know, the Lord can always take something that's very familiar to us and breathe fresh life into it and meet us where we're at in our journey because every one of us is on a journey. There's no push button answer to the battles we fight, but we do need encouragement and we need to go, we always need to go back to the source of our encouragement. Because the devil is forever trying to move us off of that. And so, uh, you know, a lot of folks have been taught to think that the book of Revelation is uh, pretty much chronological. And they, uh, some of them, many of them, many people today believe that the first three chapters apply to church history and the rest of it after chapter four is all future to us. Uh, that's not so. These visions each have their own standing, their own place in the grand scheme of things. But this one really goes all the way back to the beginning, goes back to, the, uh, to the, what Christ did for us. Uh, and the, uh, John saw, he said, I, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. And I don't think it would be difficult to demonstrate that this is, a, uh, this is a picture of God's people. This is a picture of the believing remnant of Israel who were expecting, who had been promised, uh, the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham that through his seed all the nations of the world would be blessed. And there were, in spite of the general apostasy, there was a remnant that clung to that belief and were expecting and waiting. Uh, good, it's a good picture for what we need to be doing because we have likewise been given some awesome promises about what's to come and God is looking for a people who will stand fast in those promises and expect uh, that God is going to fulfill them and he is. But anyway, they were living with that expectation and, and he describes, he likens that people waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise to being like a pregnant woman. And, you know, many times we find ourselves in that place of having an expectation, but, it ain't, but it's not here yet, and it's not all that comfortable. Now, I certainly obviously can't directly relate to a woman's pregnancy, but I think we know enough from observation, those of us who haven't experienced it, <laughs> uh, to, to get the picture of what he's talking about. But in any case, uh, she was about to give birth. So then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Now, what's he talking about there? He's talking about going all the way back to the beginning, isn't he? Because we know that at some point, at least prior to Genesis 3, we don't know when, but at some point, uh, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him, rebelled against God, said, I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going to exalt my, my throne above the stars, like, like he's pictured in uh, Isaiah chapter 14. And so he began to, uh, to rebel in his heart, this thing conceived, but he, it wasn't just him that was affected. It was a third of the angels he took with him. 
And uh, they came to the earth, and as a result of the deception of Eve leading her astray, and then Adam, with his eyes wide open, chose to follow his wife, chose to disobey God and obey the devil, uh, the whole world was plunged into a state of darkness. And we know that uh, from Isaiah's prophecy of what was going to take place when Christ came into the world, the whole world was in gross darkness. Gross darkness. It was just totally black, except for the handful of people that were hanging around Jerusalem waiting for the coming, waiting for the arrival of this promise. The world was in gross darkness, under his control. So anyway... So the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. And from the time Jesus was born, the devil was plotting one way or another to get rid of him. And of course, you know how when the, uh, the wise men came, and this was not one right after his birth as they picture it, but this was you know, sometime within the first year or two. The wise men came from the east and God had revealed to them what was coming and who was, who was being born and they told uh, the king and uh, went to Jerusalem and Herod heard about it and he ordered that everybody in Jerusalem under the age of two be slaughtered. Well, the Lord escaped that, didn't he? The Lord warned them to flee to Egypt and he stayed down there until the, the danger was past. Herod was dead. I'll tell you, it doesn't pay to be on the devil's side. I don't care what the devil plans, he cannot overturn a single thing that God has purposed. And we need to live with that knowledge and that confidence toward God. Because, folks, we're going to need it. You know, just like was prophesied in one place in the Old Testament, the people that do know their God are going to be strong and do exploits in one translation and others. It's, uh, it's strong and firmly resist Him, whatever the, the evil power is. Folks, we're going to need some confidence in God. We're going to need some experience. We're going to need to know that we have a God we can trust, whose word we can trust. And I believe that God is seeking to mature us, to grow us up in our faith so that we will have the kind of faith that will stand because God's going to do his part. God is absolutely going to be faithful to his people. And regardless of whether you and I go by the bullet or the sword or, or we live to see the Lord come or, or we die before he comes, whatever it is, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. Praise God. I'll tell you, we're on the winning side if we're on the Lord's side. And that's certainly portrayed in all of this symbolic picturing that's going on here. So anyway, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And, I, and a lot of people think this is, he's going to come down and be a political ruler. He's been ruling. He's been ruling ever since he ascended to the throne. And her child, in fact it says here, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. So no matter what the devil did, including killing him, it didn't do a bit of good. I mean, we think in, ter in earthly terms, you kill somebody, that's the end of it. You won. Well, he didn't win. He actually engineered his own defeat. Praise God. That's my hope today is what he accomplished by that death. But, he, but death could not defeat him. And I'm going to serve one who, can, who has the power to defeat death itself. Because he holds the keys of death in the grave. Praise God. So anyway, her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place, and uh, I won't try to, try to unpack that. But anyway, there was war in, in heaven, verse 7. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. He's talking about a place of authority, a place of rule, a place of dominion that the devil had occupied. There was a war. It's not the kind of war you and I can see. It's not the kind that's fought with, with bullets or, or swords or whatever that you're able to see. But it was real. Wouldn't it have been something to have been able to be there in the spirit and see not just what happened physically, but to see what was going on in the spirit? Man, there was a full-fledged, all-out war in heaven. And the devil was convinced in his heart this was his opportunity to win forever. To destroy this and dominate and, and use and destroy this, this creature that God had made. It was made in his image. The human race. But he didn't win, did he? Thank God. He was not strong enough. You know, he's not strong enough today. We do not adequately reckon on that. 
And God wants, to, wants us to learn to reckon on the fact that he was absolutely defeated because he was. They lost their place. No longer is he ruling in this planet. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to, earth, to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God. Once again, you've got so many people looking for a kingdom that's going to come and, literally, and be literally visible where news, news uh, reports or, or newsmen will go and interview Jesus and say, what's your, pro what's your plan for this year? And I'm, I'm just, you know, embellishing a little bit. But you get the idea. There's literally going to be a, king, a military and political kingdom ruling over this world and enforcing peace and harmony and all that stuff. No, this is a different kind of kingdom. But it's, it's a lot more real than that one would be. Now, have come, glorious, in it, it's past tense. This is not now we've got, the, now we, now we got hope. Now we got, maybe we can work it out. Maybe we can fight our way through. No, this is, has come. It's a fact. It's a historical fact. Praise God. I want to reckon on something that's a fact and not something that's hope so or not something I've got to engineer. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. Yes. Praise God. I believe he wants to share that with us, don't you? For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Now you think about the condition of the human race when Jesus came. You know, we already mentioned that they were under darkness. But that darkness certainly affected their minds, but it was a darkness of sin and its power to destroy. It calls the, it calls the devil the accuser. Now an accusation, is, you know, could be just you're accusing somebody falsely, but I'll tell you the devil was not accusing the human race falsely, was he? Because the scripture is so plain, and we know it from our own experience, if we're honest at all, that there is none good. Not one. None good. You know, the, uh, I mentioned this before, but the question often is posed of Christians, why do bad things happen to good people? And the answer is, from God's point of view, there are no good people. The real question we ought to be asking is, why do so many good things happen to all of us who are sinners? You remember the, uh, the movie we watched uh, some time ago now, The Road to Emmaus? Well, the, the point was made so well. You know, one of the disciples was, ta was talking to Jesus and saying, you know, well, I'm, I, I'm, I, I made mistakes, I'm not perfect. And Jesus turned and said, but he is. He is. I'll tell you, one little taint of sin would absolutely ruin heaven forever. And God cannot be supremely good without completely eradicating sin from the universe. That is how serious it is. And that is how hopeless our condition is without him. There's absolutely nothing we can do. Satan can accuse all day long because there, there's a law of God. And it's, it's not, a, as we said so many times, it's not a law like he passed a bunch of rules. This is a law of being. This is his nature. And to defy his nature and his likeness is, again, it's like defying the law of gravity or the law of, of fire or, or what have you. You defy it, you're, gonna, you're, you're the one who's going to lose. There's no, there's no winning against that law. It's inflexible. The law of God demands the death of every sinner. No exceptions. So you want to try to stand before a holy God on your own? You're going to try? You're going to do something to, to, to engineer his acceptance? That's, how, that's what God was dealing with. But the very fact that he dealt with it, the very fact that he did something, 
is what reveals his true nature. Yes, he's holy. Yes, his law is of, of holiness is inflexible. But his nature is love. And it's one at immeasurable cost that reached out in spite of what we were to do something about it. He didn't look down and say, I see those, some of those people are really trying hard. I'm just going to give them a boost. I don't need a boost. I need a brand new me. There's nothing I can look to. There's not a single thing that I can look to in myself. But that's the glorious thing about the gospel. It does not ask me to look inside and find the means of saving myself. At no point does, I mean, there's a part that we play, but the, en the energy, the impetus, ev none of it comes from me in the sense that I was born with it. Therefore, I'm different from everybody. No. What I have, if I have anything in the Lord, he gave me. And to him alone belongs the glory. But you know, if it was any other way, you and I would never have in this whole world a place of rest. Because we would always have a place, we would always be in that place where we would be worried, have I done enough? Is there something I don't know about that I'm not doing and therefore, oh my God, we have always got to go back to the rock, to the foundation that was laid. I know from my own experience, I know there are battles being fought in lives. Everybody here is assaulted by something. You're fighting, you're fighting a battle. And sometimes it gets weary. And it gets to be a struggle. And sometimes you're tempted to, to give in to a, a, a sense of futility. Oh, how can this possibly ever change? But I'll tell you, God wants us to get our eyes off of our weakness, off of, our, off of the battle itself in a sense, and back on to the reality of what he did for us at the cross. Because we have no other resource. But of course we don't need another one, do we? That's absolutely, fully sufficient. So anyway, the key, and I, and I guess part of this I guess came back to me because I had written a letter to someone who was struggling. They opened their lives up to demons. That sounds crazy to some people, but it's real. All they did was dabble in new age, dabble in some of that kind of stuff, open, open the door to spirits, and those spirits came in, and they don't want to leave. You need to pray. Remember people like that. They're calling and writing for help. And we need, we need the Lord to open eyes, open and give faith, because that's the only thing that's going to, going to absolutely seal up the, the vessel and, and allow Christ to come and to dwell in, in all those places where the devil has got that hold. But anyway, this verse that is so familiar to us, they overcame him. Now, you know, who is it that overcame him? See, this is a voice coming from heaven. He's looking down here and saying, the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of the brothers, he's talking about us. That's you and me. And what a glorious thing it is. It talks about this in the past tense, as though God is now looking ahead, isn't he? Think about the verb tenses that show up in this passage. Now it's almost as if God is looking back outside of time. And he's saying, they overcame him. Now you and I are right in the middle of time. We're in the middle of all this progression of stuff that we call time. To us, the battle is hot sometimes. To us, it's very real. To us, it looks like, oh my God, you know, is this ever going to be over? Oh, thank God it is. Praise God. But here it says, they overcame him. But it's not they overcame him by their willpower, by their strength, by anything other than the blood of the Lamb. How can you overcome the accusation of the enemy? By any of the means. Because when he accuses you and me of being sinners, is he right? Yeah. We've broken God's law. 
Uh, there's, we have no defense. We cannot stand before God and, and say, they made me do it. They, you know, this condition caused it. I'm guilty. No longer is it them and pointing fingers. When we stand before the holiness of God, it's going to be us alone. We're going to see. But here's a way. That, and it's not a way that we came up with. It's a way that God came up with. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. What a cost. But you know when we, we were singing the song again this morning, in Christ alone, praise the Lord. Rich words. And I'll tell you, when he died, the law was satisfied. That's the thing. God, how could God be just? How could he remain the holy, righteous God he is, faithful to his law, if he just said, well, if he took pity on us. Say, there's a sinner, but I'm feeling good today. I think I'm going to have pity on them and just ignore their sins and just sort of accept them anyway. That's not justice. But how could a holy God satisfy both justice and mercy? That's the, that's the question. And I'll tell you, there is, there is, there's a lot of religions in the world. There isn't one that gets it, that, that has the picture of what the real need is or what the solution is. Somebody had, somehow that law had to be satisfied. And so my sins and yours were charged to the sinless Son of God. You think of the worst things you've ever done. If you've got a conscience... Think of the worst things you've ever done and realize that he was charged with that. Do we have grounds to worship him? Oh my. Oh my. Praise God. He was charged. And what I deserved, he got. And he did it willingly. He did it joyfully. He did it so that I could be free. So that God would, was free to forgive me. Because justice was fully satisfied. God's heart was to have mercy on me, but how could he if I was still guilty? But the guilt question was satisfied because Jesus took my sin. You know, that was pictured throughout the Old Testament. It was a foreshadowing of what was to come. And they would, they would literally sacrifice a lamb. And they would, you know, many times the priest would go through their, their ritual, but it was meant to teach them. It wasn't the ritual did it. But it was, what, it was the act of faith and trusting what God had said to do and let God take care of the, the legal details. And he did when Jesus came. He took care of the real basis for that. But their basis in faith was really looking forward to that by that lamb. And their sins were literally placed upon that lamb. And that lamb had to shed its blood. And when the, and you know, of course the day of atonement, the high priest would take the blood of that sacrifice and go into the very holiest place and sprinkle it and God would forgive their sins he would recognize that do you remember the 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 story Jesus told about the two who went into the temple and what a what an obvious picture that is of the one self-righteous religious man who has just built himself a little little make-believe world of righteousness one glimpse of God would have, it would have destroyed it in a, in a second, but oh no, I'm righteous. Look at me. I've, I arranged my behavior to conform to my religion. Doesn't make, of course, he didn't pay any attention to what was going on on the inside. You know, like Jesus said, they, they're like whited sepulchers. They, got, they look good outside, but on the inside, they haven't changed a bit. They're no different from the worst sinner out there. They just learned how to ma manage their behavior a little bit. But oh, what a phony thing that is. And for, for him to go in there and brag to God, oh God, I thank you, I'm not like other men. <laughs> what, how, how utterly ridiculous. He was as bad or worse. He was just like other men in one respect, but he was worse in that he didn't realize it. Religious people are the hardest ones to reach because they don't believe they have a need. They don't see that need. I pray that God will awaken the consciences to the sense, just like he did with Isaiah, who, who looked around and, and woe is this, woe to this one, woe to that one, woe to the other one. He stood before God and said, woe is me. I am undone. Now he descended from the prophet looking down upon people to somebody who stood right beside them and realized 
the real deal. I've seen, what the, I've seen the real thing. I've seen what real holiness is about. And I'm not like that. Oh, what's going to happen to me is, was the sense that I know he had. But didn't the Lord immediately do something about it? Touched his lips. What did he touch it with? With a coal. Where did the coal come from? An altar. What does that represent? Sacrifice, doesn't it? You see that picture being, being given to God's people to teach them what God plan, God's plan was. But there was another man there who all he said was, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, it doesn't quite come across in the English. I know you've heard Brother Thomas say this in the past, and I'd, I, I dug into it yesterday, not realizing it was going to be connected today. But I happened to say, hey, I'm sitting in front of my computer. I got a chance to check into, that, into the Greek there. And what he, what he used to say is exactly right, that there's more to that mercy that he was talking about than just, I'm feeling sorry for you, so I'm going to show you some favor anyway. There was a foundation for that. The word be merciful has everything to do with make an atonement. He was asking God, he, he was standing in the place of a sinner. He was not making any excuse for his sin. He was absolutely standing before God without any pretense or any excuse, realizing there was nothing he could do. And so by asking God to act, he was not just saying, God, feel sorry for me. He was saying, God, I'm depending on you to do something about my hopeless situation. Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't want to be this way. I want to be right with you, but I know there's nothing I can do. And so I'm just appealing to you, make an atonement for my sin. Be merciful, make an atonement. It's, it's really the two sides of the same word. And you trace that word through and it has everything to do with, with doing away with sin, with doing something, and God's the only one that can do that, and he did it. And that's the foundation of this thing. But we live with a devil who will never stop accusing. He will put a magnifying glass on everything that's wrong with you. He will do everything in his power to undermine your confidence and mine in God. And suddenly in our battles, we feel like in order to gain God's favor and to gain a favorable outcome, we've got to qualify ourselves somehow. Anybody ever fall into that trap? Oh, it's quiet. Anybody ever not fall into that trap? Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Life is going to be filled with battles. They don't, they don't happen all at once. There's no push-button solution where we suddenly leap to the full glorious victory. We're all grown up now. Man, we're going to have to slug our way through, but we're going to have to do it on a true foundation with true principles guiding us. And the moment we begin to ingest these ideas about self-qualification, we are on untenable ground. Because there's nothing I can do that's going to truly give me a faith toward God based upon my performance. I'm going to have to come to him some other way. And I'll tell you, no matter what happens, we are going to have to learn to go back to the, to the sacrifice of Christ. End of story. There is no other ground we can stand upon. If we're going to gain the victory he's talking about here, we are going to absolutely have to partake of what he has purchased for us at such an incredible cost. And God's going to allow you and me, and he is allowing you and me, every day to go into to experience situations tailor-made to us in which that principle, simple as it sounds to our minds, is challenged. And it's going to have to become more than something we just say, I believe that doctrinally. Yes, that's what the word says. I believe it. Praise God. Sing about it. And then we go forth, and we, it's not really the guiding principle of our heart. I pray that God will make it real. Isn't that something we can ask God, Lord? You know where I'm at. Did not the man 
Jesus told one man, he said, if you believe, all things are possible. What did he say? Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So here's, a, here's an honest man. Do you believe that God who will, you know, we can't come and pretend, oh God, I'm full of faith and power, you know. Who are you kidding? You know, when we're going to do that, it's pretty much bravado. We're just making it up. Or we're trying to work it up. We need to ask God to give us a faith and a conviction that will stand the test in those times of battle. Where we know that there was a victory won. And we know that we, have, we are qualified, as Paul says in Colossians 1, qualified to, for the inheritance of the saints in light. Let me get the exact wording there. I think it's pretty close. Praise God. We're... Yeah, in, in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. He has qualified you. He has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, that's, God has done his part. God has absolutely done his part. But you know, it's not as though we sit back and say, okay, God, you know, put me in my rocking chair, my spiritual rocking chair. Smooth the path to heaven. You've done it all. And we sit there and snore and just have a, no. There's two sides to that, isn't there? You remember when Paul talked about what the one thing that he did Reaching forth, you know, forgetting the things that are behind, reaching forth to the things that are before. And he, he talks about the, uh, I mean, the whole sense. What is it that he's about? He had a sense that I am laying hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. So do you, do you see two sides to that? Paul didn't, didn't come into this relationship with God because he somehow sought it, engineered it, did something. He was going about his business as God's enemy, and the Lord reached out and said, uh-uh, I've got a different life for you. I'm, laying, I'm revealing myself in such a way that you can't escape that revelation. It's true. I'm, who, I'm exactly the opposite of who you thought I was. You thought I was a fake, but I'm the son of God, and I've come to, I've come to call you to serve me. He was laid hold of. He was arrested. You know, we need to be arrested. We need God to absolutely arrest us because there's not a soul on the planet who will come willingly. If God does not work with your heart and bring conviction that you are lost without this Savior, if he does not convict you of, the, of your sins and, and how he sees them, you'll just go on your, your merry way. And it'll be disaster in the end. But he loves us enough to reach out and to deal with hearts and to work with them. And he did it with Paul. But he didn't just put Paul in the easy chair. It became a war, didn't it? And Paul's vision, his sense of what his life was about was to lay hold of that for which I have been laid hold of. Well, that tells me right off the bat that there were lots of things that were ahead that Paul had not laid hold of. That life is a question of growing up and learning, and, and, and we don't have all that we will have. In other words, it's not a question of, of trying to achieve things so much as it is laying hold of things that, that Christ has already achieved. There's riches that are unsearchable, that are, that are laid up for us in the bank of heaven. They are ours. We, th we have every right to them, and we can sit here all day and say, Praise God, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich and live like paupers because we don't take hold of what he has won for us. So that became the, the sense that governed Paul's life and he was trying to transmit that to the believers. You don't sit back in a rocking chair. You've got a war in your hands. The devil is going to oppose you at every stage. He's going to do everything in his power to discourage you, to convince you, to misdirect you, 
to cause you to try to operate in, in human strength instead of relying upon the grace of God? we got a war on our hands, folks, and that's just the way it is. But it isn't meant to discourage us. It's meant to grow us up. You know, the Lord could easily have made salvation a, a push-button thing. If he could speak a, 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 a galaxy into existence in a moment of time, could he not save a sinner in a moment of time and make them instantly like Christ? Well, he didn't do that, did he? There's a process. There's something that is accomplished by the process that could not be accomplished any other way. And, you know, we see it in, in human life. We see it in, in the fact that a child has, has human life when they're born, but they're pretty helpless. And they've got to grow, and you expect them. The Lord is, is not angry, I mean, any more than we should be angry with a small child for their lack of adult abilities. The Lord sees every one of us right where we're at, and he loves us. And all he wants us to do is to look up, fight the good fight of the faith, trust in him, but always go back to the source of our help so that today we grow a little, tomorrow we grow a little. I believe God is wanting to minister faith to us that we don't have because you know, that's our problem. We listen to the wrong voice. We see our own weaknesses. We, we struggle against things that we cannot beat in ourselves. We go at things the wrong way when faith is the only, faith is the coin of the realm. And God is longing to give it to us. You know, I, I was blessed by that letter from Brother Kumar. I was blessed by his spirit. I believe the Lord has given him a rest and a faith. You know, it's not something you can work up. But I believe God can give us a faith according to the situation that he has us in. And I'll tell you, many times the battles that we fight are not ones where we can just push the button and it's gone. Sometimes they last years. You know, Abraham is the father of faith, isn't he? God gave him wonderful promises. How long did it take for Isaac to come? 25 years. Now, most battles aren't that long. But I'll tell you, a lot of times, God calls us to fight a battle over a period of time. You know, was it, was it Walter Hughes? Many years ago, some of you were here when all this happened. I, this was before I got here. And uh, was he the one that had the cancer on his ear? And some of you remember how the Lord did minister of faith to pray for that cancer. Did it just happen? Did it just go away? No. It got worse. Does that, usually, does that happen in some of your battles? The minute you take a stand of faith, it gets worse? Well, that's the enemy. To, to, to me, that ought to be encouragement because that means the enemy's upset and, and concerned. He feels threatened. He doesn't like faith. He wants to do everything he can to undermine it. And boy, he was, he was working big time on Brother Thomas and Brother Hughes. And telling Brother Thomas, you'd better send him to the doctor. It's getting worse, and you're, you're responsible, you, you know. And so all those kinds of doubts, and he would, he would just, this went on for a period of time. It kept getting worse, kept getting worse, kept getting worse. And then one day, Brother Thomas noticed it was a little smaller. He said, aha, <laughs> devil, look at that. You know, we, we want to look at something, and the Lord can encourage us when, that, when the time comes. But anyway, over a period of time, you remember the story how it began to recede, and then one day he was putting his glasses on, knocked the last little bit off, and is just like a baby's skin. I tell you, God wants to teach us lessons of real faith. Now, I, I know the difference, at least in this sense, that I have tried to have faith when it wasn't the Lord. I'm going to find a scripture verse. I'm going to go by a principle. I'm just going to, you know, will something into, into being but based on my own, what I want to happen. But I believe that God can give us a relationship with him where we can have a real faith for things. But I'll tell you, that faith is going to be tried. That faith is absolutely going to be challenged over and over again. And that's what God is looking for as we stand. As we get real faith, and then we stand upon that, and we defend that ground against every assault of the enemy, God is going to honor that faith. Didn't you sense that spirit of faith in the Kumar's letter? Yeah. And I believe we have every right to stand with him. 
Now, if the Lord wants to take him, he'll, he'll, he'll make that plain. He'll give everybody a piece about it. And he'll deal with the, with the results. But I'll tell you, I, time and time again, that man has been challenged over the years. And I believe God, I don't believe his ministry is over. He's still in his, well, pro approaching his mid-50s, I guess, early 50s. And uh, he has a voice that reaches a large part of uh, the Telugu-speaking world, uh, hundreds, uh, 100 million or more. He goes out on the broadcast there and all the, all the ministry that they have, all those places. I was, I was trying to remember, I, I did not look it up when I, he referred to the project they were working on, but I believe that that is the colony that, t that Tony and I visited. I was there with Jimmy one time, too. And I think I mentioned this at one of the graveside services. And we had gone there, Jimmy and I had gone there for a e Sunday evening service, and the people had just lost, I don't know if it was a pastor or some prominent member of the congregation. Well, that particular tribe had a tradition. To them, that meant the place they were living was cursed. And so their tradition was they would literally, physically uproot the village and move it someplace else because somebody died there. And so now they're wrestling with this tradition. And I believe the Lord helped us to at least add a note of faith to that, to, to come against that. I mean, we didn't just, you know, like that, but we wanted to try to encourage them and uh, to stand. Well, you know, when Tony and I went and we took that infamous hike and climb and came back and were so dead tired, it was to that place that we came. And the village was still there. So God had ministered a faith to stand in that circumstance. And they were still, not only were they there, they had grown. We met we didn't meet in the building this time. We met out in front of it. And people were scattered all over the place. And, of course, it was loudspeakers are common in India, so it, it was boomed out to where everybody could hear it. And in spite of our uh, fatigue, to say the least, um, I, the Lord gave us strength. When I got up to speak, I felt a strength I didn't feel on any other occasion on that trip. I know Brother, Brother Kumar thought, oh, well, you just greet the people and, and leave. But... I stood up and the Lord just came, came down with some strength and there was a positive message of faith. Uh, boy, I tell you, we've got a resource that we don't realize. We're not out here on our own trying to muddle through. We've got a supernatural Christ who is able to live in us and give us victory. Be all that we need in those times when we are utterly without strength. It's not when we're strong that we're strong. It's when we're weak that we're strong. Because it's not our strength that does anything, it's His. Right. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. But anyway, the Lord helped us to, to minister and encourage the people. And, uh, you know, we left and the word since has been that that particular group has grown. And that's the church, I believe, that they are literally working on, trying to expand to accommodate the crowd. So that they will be able to meet, you know, obviously the hot weather is coming and one thing and another, rain sometimes. But uh, anyway, we, we can certainly stand with them. And let's not just say, oh, God, I hope he gets better. Let's just, let's just stand. Yes. Praise God. So anyway, that's the, uh, the blood of the Lamb gives us a right to, to stand there and say, he has forgiven me. Yes, I know I'm not there yet. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm on the road, and that's, where I, that's my heart. That's where I want to go. But I have a right to stand here as if I had never sinned because my hope is in him and I'm trusting him these the, the weakness that I have just experienced I've, I give it to him Lord I come before you you have promised grace to help me in time of need I can come to that throne you notice when that scripture in, in uh, chapter 12 talks about him it says he was carried to a throne he still sits on that throne you and I can go not just to, the, to some high place in this, in this world's governments. We can go to the throne room of the universe and know that we can be received at your weakest, at your worst. You are welcome to come there. Don't come there and say, oh God, I deserve your help, but come and say, oh God, I need you. I want to be your child. I want to be yours, but I have no power. And he has promised that grace 
what you and I need to succeed as Christians will be given to us. Given. Why? Because we deserve it. Because it pleases him to do it. Praise God. By the word of their testimony. You know, there's so many sides to this, I guess. A lot of times we say, well, that's the word of God, and it is. That's what Jesus used. But it's not as though the word of God is like a rabbit's foot. It's not some little saying you can, not, it's not magical sayings. That you can just haul out of the Bible and say, the Bible says this. I'll tell you, it has got to be a product of God's revelation to the heart. And that's part of our journey. You and I need to hear and be, be changed by that word that becomes engrafted in our hearts. God will minister faith. How does it come? Hearing, by, hearing and by the word of God. God will give you and me the faith that we need to take hold of something that's in here. And instead of just something in a book, it will become something that is real. Something that can come out of our mouths with conviction. I don't need a scripture I can haul out and just sort of repeat like a mantra. And expect the devil's going to feel threatened by that. I need something that God can enable me with a spirit of faith to speak something that he has made real. He has breathed life into that word. And now it's a conviction where I can look him in the eye. It isn't just quoting scripture, though. I think about, about stuff in the Bible, or like the three Hebrew children. The heathen king got this idea of building a humongous uh, statute of himself, or to himself, to his own honor. Whatever it was, it was heathen. And everybody was commanded to bow down when they heard all the music and all the cacophony of the sound that they were producing, but they were instruments, and bow down to this thing. And the Hebrew children wouldn't do it. They were some of the young men that had been captured by Nebuchadnezzar and brought to Babylon to serve in his government. And there they were, his young governmental trainees, and they were, and everybody else was bowing and they wouldn't bow. And the penalty for not bowing was being thrown into a fiery pit or furnace. Now you better have some conviction if you're going to take a stand like that. What would you and I do? You know, we better have a real foundation. Do you think that their stand against the mightiest emperor of that day, I mean, this is, this is not just a Bible story. This happened. The day came when they were standing there and he was looking at them, and he wasn't happy. What would you and I do? What will we do when things like that, the equivalent of that, happens to us? You think God might want to be building some faith and some confidence and some conviction? And their conviction was, our God is able to deliver you, deliver us from your hand. We don't know whether he will. Now see, they didn't even have a conviction that said, I know what's going to happen. I know that there's going to be somebody else in there and we are not going to be bothered by your fire, O king. They didn't know that. Think of the strength of that kind of conviction. And I'll tell you, they stood and said, we don't know whether we're going to be delivered or not, but we do know one thing. We're not bowing to your idol. You think that just might have a little, little place in this business about overcoming the devil? God is going to have to minister. God is ministering faith to his people. If we will open our hearts to it, God will give us the strength of conviction to take a stand in the areas that affect our lives. Sometimes it's against things in ourselves that we've, we discover. Tendencies in ourselves. Situations. Could be sickness. We can, we can seek God's wisdom in those things and, and ask him for a real faith to deal with it. Because sometimes, as with the case of Paul, it wasn't getting rid of it, was it? It was, my grace is enough. That was God's answer. But when that, was, when that the answer came, that ministered faith to Paul. He didn't try to proof text his way out of that situation. He looked to God, and God gave him the wisdom he needed. He exercised that with a spirit of confidence toward God. And so he was able, when the devil came to discourage him, he was able to say, I understand 
What's going on here? I get it. God wants me to remember my weakness so that I will depend upon him. Thank God for the wisdom that he's showing me right now. Because I'm experiencing this difficulty, God's power is able to be released through me in a way that it would not be otherwise. And I'm rejoicing in that. I'm glad for this situation because I understand what's going on. And that's more important to me than my comfort. God is looking to give us wisdom and faith in the battles that we fight. And he is faithful to do that. Praise God. You know, Brother Thomas used to say, faith starts where it's at with what it has. And of course, he said it starts where it's, where it's not. You can't do that exactly, but you do start with, what you, with where you're at in spite of what you don't have, which is the thought. Praise God. Every one of us that's, that knows him at all we're somewhere on the journey. Now you may not have the faith to move mountains. I certainly don't. But we have, we have a measure of faith. That if we will exercise the faith to say, there is a victory that I can lay hold of. There is a victory that was won. It's history. It's mine. It was won for me. I don't deserve it. But he gives it to me because he loves me. I have the right to it. My right to it is not based upon what I've done or what I am. It's based upon what Jesus did and his love and his promise to me. Same principle you see operating throughout the scriptures, throughout the Old Testament, the heroes of faith. God gave them a promise. They stood upon it even to the point of death. Even to the point of persecution, they stood upon that promise. I'll tell you, we're going to have to have the strength of conviction in this hour. And I see the need for it. I mean, how many of you see the handwriting on the walls to where our society is going? We've said it before, we're circling the drain. There's judgment that is coming upon this nation and upon the world. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. But we serve a God who's faithful, who's going to carry us through whatever is necessary. And I believe that, I believe that we're going to have to do some fighting. I don't mean guns and all that stuff. I'm, we're going to have to take a stand in the spirit and have a confidence because satanic power is going to reach a zenith in this world. There is deception that is amazing out there. You know, didn't Jesus warn about this? He said there's going to be lying, great lying signs and wonders. That if, it po if it were possible, it would deceive even the very elect. If it's that much of a challenge to us, what about the rest of the world? The devil has blinded the minds of them that don't believe. They don't get it at all. They're just blindly blundering along toward the precipice. Oh, I, play, I tell you, God has a people, though, and in this hour, he's going to finish the work that he has promised to do. And he is going to be the hope and the strength of his people. But, my God, do we muddle along in defeat, accepting defeat, accepting futility, it's not, uh, resistance is futile, I'm tempted to say, but it's, <laughs> that's what the devil, that's the devil's mantra, but uh, it's not. But you know, there's another part of this. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And a lot of times that's the problem. If God is zeroing in on some part of our lives that we're hanging on to, the devil has... I mean, that's, that's a prescription for defeat. The, devil, the devil's greatest ally against you and against me is this flesh, because its desires have not changed. Salvation is not about fixing the flesh and taking away its, its appetites. It's about the, uh, the influx of a new life, receiving a brand new life. And that life is stronger than the other one. If we will rely upon its power and yield ourselves to it, we will have a strength against those things. But if we yield ourselves habitually to something, it will be our master. To whom you yield yourselves, you're the, you're the service to that thing to whom you yield. Romans 6. And I'll tell you, 
We, there's no such thing as a salvation where we sort of cling to our lives or parts of our lives and say, well, that's mine. I'm going to do as I please, but I want your salvation, Lord. The devil's still got an got a open door. You may block the front door, but if you're, your back door is wide open, big deal. You might look real good with that barricaded front door, but it isn't going to do you a bit of good. The devil's going to come in and set up housekeeping. And I'll, t I'll tell you, the Lord can work with our hearts to where we are able to let go. That's, that's part of the warfare. You and I daily are called to be letting go. You know what I'm talking about? Am I right? Yeah, that's it. There are things in our lives that God is going to shine the light on. Thank God he doesn't do it all at once. But when he reveals that this is the thing, this is the, this is the hold, this is the reason the devil has the hold that he does, that he is such a, a master in this area, and you're struggling against this, this is it, give it to me. Let go. We recognize that our lives are not our own. They were bought with a price. But oh, what he is able to do with these lives when we give them to, to him is so much better than anything we could ever do. But how he wields power by causing people to be afraid to die. It's the fear of death is how he rules over this planet. We are, oh, we're just afraid to let go of that whole thing. We think we're the master, but we're the slave. And the Lord has come to set us free. There's a dimension to this that we don't often mention that I, I believe is really important. We tend to think of this passage in a very individualistic sense, me and my battles. But God does not see the church of Jesus Christ as simply a hodgepodge collection of individuals, each on separate paths to glory. He sees us as a body. He sees us as a unit. And I'll tell you, the battles that we fight, we need to fight not just for me, and I hope you do, hope you do all right. This is for us, Amen. where we are fighting one for another. Amen. And how many times in, in a real war do you have a soldier who is suddenly under attack? And they're maybe beyond their own strength, but yet you can come and bring reinforcements to that situation, and it makes all the difference. We have, we have not, the, not only the right, but I, was, but I would dare say the duty to come to one another's rescue when there are battles being fought and say, God, minister strength. God, I know that they are struggling. They are trying to stand in faith, but I'm going to stand in faith with them. And I'm going to believe you with them that real spiritual life and virtue will flow into their hearts and energize them right now in this place of weakness. That's part of the overcoming. It's not, a, it's not me, it's us. Because we are growing together into the likeness of Christ. It's a, it's a corporate thing. May God help us and enable us to that end. And I believe he is. But everywhere in the scriptures you get this sense that serving God, serving Christ, is a fight. It's a fight of faith. And faith is not faith in me. Faith is, fight, is absolutely in that perfect provision that we have through Jesus Christ. You see it pictured in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6 in, in terms of a literal war that someone would have fought at that time with the armor and the helmet and the breastplate and the sword and the, and the, and the shield and all of those things. But what did he say to do? Be strong in the Lord, but to stand and fight but to do what? Having done all, to stand. And many times, that's the place we occupy. And many times, that's where the battle is won or lost. We're looking for a certain time limit on our battles. And God is saying, that's my, that's my business. I'm looking for you to stand. I want you to seek my will. I want you to get to the place where you can have a confidence that I have given you faith in a certain direction, but you're going to have to stand. You're going to have to defend that ground. The devil is going to attack you. You're going to have to plant your feet and say, God has given me strength and he's given me faith. I'm going to stand. 
and others can rally to it as they see that, as God makes them aware of that situation. But folks, that's where many of us are right now. We're standing in situations. We are standing in with needs with respect to ourselves. Don't give up the ship. This is a battle of truth against lies. And Satan will tell you everything in the book to keep you and me from, having, from exercising faith that is the only way we're going to get anywhere. Because faith looks not to me, but it looks to God. It looks to strength that I don't have. It looks to a victory that is not out there somewhere, but it was already won at the cross. I'm laying hold of something that's already mine. And so we have the right to stand, but we're going to have to fight. There's something about the process that without it, we would never become what, we, what God has purposed that we be. You know, a really very crude illustration. You know, even here on earth, there are people who are wealthy because they have worked hard. And that has helped to form their character, and we'll suppose that this wealthy person has done it the right way and it's honorable and all that. But there, there's certain characteristics that they have developed of perseverance and faith and, and you know, not giving up and all of that that they, they've developed through the process. But what happens many times with their kids, it all gets handed to them, and they're spoiled and they don't, they don't exhibit any of the characteristics of the father who's done all the hard work to get them there. That's a very crude illustration, but I believe it's a little bit like that with us in spiritual things. If we're going to grow up to be the sons and daughters of the Most High God and be like Jesus, aren't we going to have to come the same way he did? Didn't he learn obedience for the things that he suffered? Didn't he overcome and face every temptation we'll ever face? Didn't he have to do it in the weakness of his flesh, trusting in God? Yeah. And he did all that, and now he's become the author of eternal salvation. Well, we're going to be growing up into him. So I think the message the Lord would have me to lay hold of today is to always go back to the well. Go back to the source. Don't be discouraged. Seek God. If you don't have light and faith in a situation, stand fast and just wait till the light comes. Believe that it will come when it's needed. Don't let the devil attack your confidence based upon your performance. Constantly bring that to the cross and believe the promise of God that you are accepted in the beloved because of what Jesus did. Based on that period, I have no other claim upon him. And I refuse to be moved by the grace of God. I refuse to be moved onto the ground of trying to qualify myself and feel confident toward God because I've measured up in my performance. I'm, I'm just like you. I have exactly the same needs that you do. But we have a glorious Savior. There was a battle that was fought. The outcome is not in doubt. It was, it was fought and it was won. And it was won for us who are sitting here today. And anybody else who happens to hear this. And we have the right to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of us and fight the battles that you and I fight today and know that there are more coming but that's alright he's going to be with us to the end of the age he hasn't dumped us down here to see how we do he's put us in the furnace of affliction so that we can be we can grow up to be like him so be encouraged today whatever battle you're fighting here's the way we're gonna to have to stand based on his righteousness we're gonna to have to have a conviction formed by his uh, by the influx of his word and real faith that comes to our hearts based upon truth. Use that, stand in that against the devil's lies. And when, think, when it involves something that's some appetite, some part of our being that just wants to live and, and rise up and take over, we're going to have to let it go. Say, God, help me, deliver me. Amen. By faith, I just turn from this. I let it go. Amen. And then stand. Regardless of the time frame, we have the right to stand. And not say, well, I've been standing two days now and nothing's happened. Well, you all laugh because we do it. Sure we do. That's part of growing up, isn't it? But the Lord is so merciful and so wonderful to us. Praise God. Isn't the Lord good?